I'm really delighted to be moderating this panel, and once I was assigned it, it got me to thinking who was the first woman college president in the United States. Anyone know? Okay, Frances Willard was her name, and she was named president of the Evans Evanston, Illinois College for Ladies in 1871. And like the women on this stage, her influence went far beyond the college campus. Willard um, was involved in the temperance movement. She was the president of the Women's Christian Temperance Unit. She was a very influential suffragette. She did not live long enough to see the 19th Amendment enacted. She was very involved in the expansion of women's rights internationally. Parenthetically, I will add, she wrote a book called How I Learned to Bike. <laughs> because in those days, it was women not common bike. for women to ride two-wheeled bikes. And the book is actually about lessons in perseverance, something we will talk about. Willard is known to have said, the world is wide, and I will not waste my life in friction when it could be turned in to momentum. What a great quote, right? Mm -hmm. And in some ways, I think that describes all of you. You are always looking to make progress, create momentum in any number of fields, health, medicine, education, and leadership. And so here we go. Let me now introduce this really esteemed panel. And I cannot give you their full bios because they've all done so much, so read more about them. But briefly, Kathy McCartney, to my left, mm -hmm. is the president of Smith College. She is a doctor of psychology, and her research has focused on the early experiences of life, including childcare, poverty, and education. Paula Johnson is the president of Wellesley College. Paula is also a cardiologist and has had a lifelong interest and has been a leader in promoting women's health. Betsy Bradley. Betsy is here at a moment of transition in her life. <laughs> On July 1st, she's going to become the 11th president of Vassar College. So, <laughs> Betsy spent 20 years at Yale and is known for her work in strengthening healthcare systems in the United States and also internationally. One of her last positions at Yale was as the director of a program that had the primary goal of identifying and training emerging leaders. So welcome, ladies to each of you. Betsy, I, I want to start with you. As I noted, each of you comes from the medical or health field. I'd like you each to answer, but I'll start with you. Is that a weird coincidence that you all ended up as college presidents? Or is there something about um, what you learn, how you learn, what you do, how you interact, that uniquely prepares you for the position of being a college president? Well, first of all, Jackie, thank you so much for doing this. I've watched your work for decades and always been a huge fan. So thank you. be nice to us. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, and I also really appreciate Ruth putting this together. It's been terrific to even give this idea some thought about how come health behind all of our backgrounds. For me, I'm a public health expert, which is, of course, different from medicine. So maybe I could just talk about that a little bit. I think there are some perspectives that one develops in the area of public health that I hope is very helpful to leading a college. One of these is that you think about the whole, you think about the community. It's not medicine one-on-one, -on -one, it's the public's health. And one of the critical challenges, I think, in being a college president is really being able to think about the entire community. How does the community work as a whole? Um, how do different groups interact with each other? How does one resolve conflict? How do you, and so I'll stop there for um, the perspective of being holistic. The other I would say is public health is very much about harm reduction. So it gives you, I think, a um, compassion and empathetic approach to people who are struggling. You know, it's never, oh, we'll cure this. It's always, yeah, this is tough. And I think that's a lot of how one is present with people who are 18 to 21, struggling with really tough things, 
a public health person, I hope, will come at it not, oh, we could solve this, but more, let's be present with you while you grow and while you are empowered forward. So those two principles that are deep in my training, I hope to be able to bring to the presidency. Paula? Uh, I just also want to thank you, Jackie, of course. and it's wonderful to be here with my colleagues. Um, well, I'm finishing year one in four days. Oh, okay. And so, uh, you know, after many, many years in, in both medicine and public health, this has been a phenomenal, uh, just really phenomenal transition. And as I thought about this, um, I thought about my career in medicine and medicine and public health. And the fact that I worked in, we work in complex systems. We work in systems that require us, in terms of breakthrough science, to work across disciplines. We have to work in systems in which we're both thinking about teaching and research, but we're also thinking about direct patient care um, and those intersections of those, which I also think helps us think about higher education. And we have to be, in medicine and in public health, very outward facing. So the pressures that we have faced over the years, um, particularly in medicine, mm -hmm. in academic medicine, I think thinking about complex systems, working across disciplines, and then being outward facing and understanding the intersection of our institutions with the larger community are all, to me, very important for higher education and I think tremendous preparation. And then the last part, um, I think it's being, uh, being a doctor, being a physician. Um, as a physician, we care for patients. We think about patients not only who are in front of us as a set of symptoms or a disease, but more and more from the public health standpoint, we think about them as the, in the context of their social environment. And I think that that is very important today as we think about who our students are. The students do not come to us and plop down in either Vassar or Smith or Wellesley without histories and a past. They come from, not only are they diverse, but they come from a diversity of backgrounds with a diversity of struggles. And listening and hearing and understanding how we create that larger whole, how we address their issues in that context. I think that piece has really, is, is a tremendous preparation. The previous panel had a lot of primary physicians and they were talking about how many struggles there are associated with that these days. What's, what's been uh, less hard in your life? Your previous life, Paula, or your year as a oh. college president? <laughs> That's not a fair question. <laughs> they, are, they are challenging in very different ways. Yeah. They're, they're challenging in different ways with tremendous ability to make a difference in people's lives. And what I will say to you, what has been one of the tremendous joys of being a college president, I think particularly at a liberal arts college, is that with all the complexity with all of what we have to think about both internally and externally, there is a unity of mission that is very, very powerful. And every day that you wake up, whatever the issue is you're facing, you are there to, for me, it's to educate young women in the most powerful way to make their difference in the world. And it's all in service uh, to that. And we can talk later about the health and well-being of, we of those students. We will, we will. Kathy? Well, I'm a developmental psychologist, yeah. and um, I guess that uh, differenti differentiates me a little bit from my colleagues here, but we are all social scientists, and when I was thinking about what connected us, all of us have been interested in applied problems. We've made theoretical contributions to our fields, but um, I think we've been driven problem solvers throughout um, our careers, and that's certainly something that you do every day when you're a college president. I also think that all of us have been interested in caregiving in one form or another. So for me, it's been about both mother-child interaction and teacher-child interaction. And that gives you a kind of other focus that I think is good to have in this kind of role. Because so much of what we do is listening to students, to faculty, to staff, to alumni, and hearing about their hopes and dreams for the institution. And um, sometimes, um, 
enacting really, really good ideas. So the institution building is just a very exciting part of this job. And more of a singular mission, perhaps, than in your previous careers? I think it's so different. Uh, the, the, you know, when you think about it, I, I talked about this early on in my career when I was a dean at Harvard, which I was a, a dean of the School of Education, so I was essentially leading a small college because Harvard's so decentralized. But you get appointed to one of these positions because you're a good teacher and a good researcher. But what do you really know about leading an organization? Mm -hmm. I mean, we are essentially CEOs of our organization. And um, I think when you were saying what singularly prepares you or uniquely, I think all of us uh, were attracted to this because we're good at institution building and because other people saw that within us. Betsy, I know you're just coming into the job, and, and so you've given it a lot of thought, obviously. Do you think that there are any vulnerabilities or disadvantages to come from the world where you have and go to the world where you plan mm -hmm. to be president? I have given this a fair amount of thought, and um, I think some people who are scientists in the audience will really relate to this. Um, we have just a very high standard for evidence. I mean. We run studies. In public we health. We intervene, yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, all of us, I think, in our yeah. social sciences. We intervene, we want to see, OK, what's the odds ratio? What changed? What didn't? There's a certain kind of precision, false sense of precision, I will say, but precision to um, the, the scholarship and to really say, that actually is not going to be possible. Educational interventions are more diffuse. The outcomes are more. Uh, less well measured. We don't have an NIH for education. I can't just look at a data set and say, okay, we have 2,600 colleges in the country. 200 of them graduate 75% or more of their students, and the others don't. Okay, what's different about those others? There's no data. And so suddenly, I think somebody who has been spending 20 years with data and thinking, um, how do you know what the best practice is? It's evidence-based. I think it's a limitation that I may bring. I mean, I'm going to try to get over it, but you know, I might be a little impatient. Like, let's get the data before we make a decision. And I think that's maybe that'll be a benefit. I, I'm going to I'm going to tell you, Betsy. I think it's going to be an absolute benefit. Ah. I, I think it's going to be a real benefit because I think that there have been many ways in which, and I've seen this, and and Kathy. Um, I would be interested if you would agree, but I've seen there have been many ways in which we've sought to make difference um, in the college environment, whether it be amongst a student population or whether it be in different fields, how we intersect fields, what's the outcome. Well, a lot of times, one, it might not be based on evidence, um, and our job is to find the evidence. Yeah. And two, as we make change, what are the systems we actually need to put into place mm -hmm. to understand the impact? And I think this is important because I, I think, again, in the world of healthcare, we have been forced, um, and now I think we are embracing the need for evidence based strategies mm -hmm. with proven outcomes. And I do think that in higher education, quite frankly, with the cost of higher education today, that our constituents, whether they be parents, whether it be the government, um, whether it be funders, are really going to demand that kind of rigor. And I think we're beginning to see it. And I, so I think that that framework is extremely positive. I think it's a benefit, but I don't know, Kathy may have something to say on this. I'm just, my, the detriment of it is just, are you pa it, can one be patient enough? Yeah. You know, it's sort of like coming into this gigantic industry and thinking, oh, wow. There isn't research on this that we've been doing in healthcare for 20 years. Yeah. So, yeah. will the staff sort of be down, girl, down? Wait a minute. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. It takes some time. That's what my worry is. But. Kathy? Well, I think it's an advantage, too, that all of us are rigorous social scientists who have hard, high standards for evidence. I do. But um, we're going to have to make decisions often where, there, where we lack it, which is, yeah. I think, your point, Betsy. And I think that's always been the case in the helping professions or in an education where um, we're, I mean, take first year writing programs, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, just as an example, we don't really know what works best. But our faculty get together and use their best judgment. And when we're 
compelled, then you know, we'll fund an expansion of something. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we look at what data are there, we benchmark maybe. Mm -hmm. My team already, I think, is sick of hearing me say, can we benchmark what we're thinking about doing with some of our competitors? You know, what, what are they doing? Let's take a look. So yeah, we have to make decisions without data, but that's okay. I would like to spend the next several minutes talking about leadership how you train the students you have in this all-important domain of leadership, most of them women. But before we get to that, I want you all to leave your modesty and humility at the door and tell me why you rose to the top. What got you there? <laughs> Is this the top? <laughs> You're going to find out before too long. <laughs> You're going to find out. Who wants to go first? Paula. <laughs> Not me. OK, so you've OK. Yeah. Um, you got the short straw. <laughs> so you know, I, I think it's, once again, this journey of where we've ended up to. And I, I want to preface this by saying, and I say this to our students and also my students kind of through the, through the years that the way we get here is not from point A to point B. It has not been a straight shot without many curves, with failures, um, and quite frankly, without many people um, engaged. And I can think of almost every step in my life where there's been both the support, the generous support from any number of people, but also the setbacks and from which you learn. Um, and I think it's truly navigating through those. And it's the resilience to keep your eye on whatever it is your goals are. And you may not know what the goals are long term, but whatever it is that you are focused on or interested in or, or drives you in terms of your passion, to keep your eye on that and to really, again, develop that resilience. And I want to get back to that piece about others working with you, because I do think this sense, and you mentioned it, Bessie, the sense of community. And community has many definitions. Um, but my communities have been very important in, you know, in my success. And it's one of the things that clearly we seek to create at our colleges that mm -hmm. really propel our students forward. Kathy? You know, I'm going to talk a little bit about my sector, which is higher education. Um, we I want you to talk about you. OK, well, I, I will in a, I just want everyone here to appreciate that we do three things. We do teaching, research, and service. And there are a lot of faculty members, especially um, very talented researchers, who don't like the service. So chairing a search committee, for example, to bring mm -hmm. a new colleague in. Mm -hmm. And I always liked all three. And I, I think that just showed. Um, and at a, so I think when I got these assignments, I did a good job and took it seriously. And then, as Paula was saying, one thing leads to another. It's not as if when I was 40, I didn't think I want to become a college president. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I sometimes describe myself as, you know, the accidental college president because at Harvard I was asked to be an acting dean for a year, and that turned into a permanent appointment as dean. And that, then I was recruited by Smith College, and by the time I was recruited, I was very interested in doing it. it um, I found it very rewarding. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that um, I think there are reasons why people thought I did a good job. So now I will try to say maybe a little bit about my philosophy of leadership. But I, I think uh, good leaders, um, they try to provide the conditions so that everyone can do his or her best work, right? They're, they're team players who provide a platform for that. They listen before they sort of pronounce. But at the same time, I think good leaders um, often know where they want to go. And so they're good at managing change and leading their institutions, but um, building the kind of consensus uh, in a world where shared governance is everything. So maybe Thank that. Thank you. Yeah. Betsy? Um, well, I've been healthy. So I, <laughs> I'm saying that I, I actually think this is incredibly important um, because all of us at certain times have had a fever, or gotten a bad test, or you know, really not been depressed, not felt healthy. And what a difference it makes um, to really have your physical and your mental health. And I think of that often. I'm often told I have high energy, and I feel like I do have high energy. 
but I'm smart enough to know it's because I've had my health. Now where's the wood I can knock on? But I think that really has been fundamental. Um, I would also say I just always feel very called to my work. Um, my work has never been something that I feel like rats. I wish I could go do something else. I just really have enjoyed what I'm doing. And I think that's helped a lot. And um, it sort of has you put in the extra elbow grease or take the extra risk or you know, just think a little bit, well, maybe we could try it this way because you're so um, inspired by it. And uh, it has a lot to do with actually choosing to go to Vassar and being lucky enough to be asked to go. Um, I think it was a really out of the box decision, to tell you the mm -hmm. truth. I have so many peers who are like, well, are you crazy? How did you do this? You've got 20 years and a chair and it's endowed and <laughs> it's got this cool title <laughs> called Grand Strategy. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I went to Vassar and I met the board and I saw the opportunities and I saw, I'm so thankful to where Cappy brought it and I know what the next decade needs to look like and I thought, oh, that fits the skills I have. And then suddenly it kind of got under my skin and felt like, oh, yep, yep, that, that's where the next thing ought to be. So I don't know if that's intuitive or just being open to the change, but I think that's helped me be successful. It's so interesting to hear the three of you t answer that question because you, you each approached it so very differently. And I guess the lesson is that there are lots of different ways to succeed and to lead and to get to where you want. Mm -hmm. I want to focus not only on leadership, but the leadership of women in particular, young women. Kathy, you wrote a piece um, talking about the four principles to develop women's leadership abilities. The first one, make the invisible visible. Sorry, did I say that right? Make the invisible visible. Policies to support parents, not just women. Mentoring and creating single sex opportunities within a mixed gender whole. The first point is what I'm most interested in because it's not immediately apparent what that means. So explain that. Well, I may be borrowing that a little bit from Marzen Banaji, who's written this book on implicit bias. Um, we don't really talk about the fact that the world is still very biased towards men. And you see that in all sectors, even, even in education. I mean, most of the education professors at Harvard were, were male, and it's a female field. So one of the things I always talk about is it, just the importance of noticing it and calling it out. I, I was speaking about this recently, and a, a woman in the audience, this was at Northwestern, said to me, well, do you call it out every single time? And I said, well, if you did, that's all you'd be doing. <laughs> so no, but um, you, pick some, you pick some battles and, and, and just try to um, establish different norms. You know, I think there are so many um, examples I could give you about this bias, but my most recent favorite one, you know, they, um, I, uh, there are these studies that they do with resumes where they ha have people evaluate different resumes. They're identical, they just change the name on top. So it's Jennifer versus John. And they did a study with um, science professors, like about 130 science professors, very recently, and just said, would you hire this person? Mm -hmm. And when it says Jennifer, um, you know, the, the probability goes down that you would hire her. And even when you would hire her, the second question is, well, how much would you pay her? And the answer is $4,000 less than John for the identical mm. resume. So we know from really good social science research that this happens all the time. I think all of us know it from our own experience, too. Excuse me, when we've been giving negative feedback, you know, um, if you act like a leader, you know, if you act sort of strong and competent, and you're a woman, I mean, have you been called bossy in your careers? <laughs> How many of the women? Haven't the, we all? Haven't we all? <laughs> that is, think about the fact that that is a word that's reserved for women and women alone. Nobody calls men bossy. So we're in this kind of double bind where if we act like leaders, we're punished for it. And if we don't act like leaders, then we don't get the leadership opportunities mm -hmm. that we deserve. Which battle, battles do you decide are worth fighting? How do you choose so you aren't battling constantly? Yeah. Um, well, I think you sort of trust your gut on that one. Uh -huh. But I've certainly had times when um, I remember I had a, a chair who didn't want to give me a course release for a grant. And with no real explanation. And I, I went home and thought about it and uh, went in the next day and said, you know, I, I'm going to talk to the dean. And I'm just telling you out of respect. And he said, well, the dean will support me. And I said, well, I need to know why 
other people can have a course release and I can't, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, that chair capitulated and I got the course release. Mm -hmm. Now that, that was big stake, right? Yes. But there are certainly other times comments that I've let go, you know, gendered comments, sexist comments, comments about the fact that I'm a mother and therefore uh, this is, you know, not serious about my career. Um, Pre-tenure, I think I took, uh, yeah, what are you going to do? Although this story I just told you was a pre-tenure story. And I'm oh, really, it was. Yeah, I'm really proud of that. Betsy, you have, with a co-author, I think, written a, a really interesting Huffington Post piece about the mixed messages of women, uh, women in leadership. They're told to, to be, have humility. They're also told to be bold. They're told to have a single focus. They're told to have multiple directions. <laughs> you concluded that these contradictions contained a secret to leadership, balancing paradox. What a great notion. Expand on that. I don't know how uh, much of this is really related to gender, but I certainly feel that women have, my own personal opinion, not scientifically based, is that women have an opportunity to be able to play multiple voices within themselves in ways that are really important in leadership. That there are the moments where boldness is absolutely required and there are the moments where humility is required. And we often get asked, well, what makes a good leader? And I think very often it is a lot about the fit of the person to the environment they're in. Which means if you're going, you're going to be in many different environments. So if you're going to be good at this, you've got to be able to pull out the part of you that would fit that environment at that moment. So it's more of a quality than a role. Yeah. I think it's more, well, I think leadership is a role, but I think your success in it, in playing that role, depends a lot on the ability to fit in the environment that is called for at that moment. Um, I have just finished running this grand strategy program, the first woman ever to run it. It's full of military people. It's a historian course, was pretty much all the faculty are men. There are 10 faculty, all men. And it's a tough place for a woman to walk into. And just as Kathy said, there were times when um, I would just be countermanded by faculty, completely shut down in the middle of a lecture. Let me tell you what that really means, Professor Bradley, by one of my peers. Oh. And there are moments where I just was bold and said, excuse me, Professor so-and-so, I won't out him. The lecture is still mine. And as bold as you could be, but then there, if that would happen three or four times in a row, you know, I'd have to let it go for a minute. So it's a bit paradoxical in that you really, you got to do two opposites mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. But I think women are skilled and are able to do this. Paula, did you want to add on that? Oh, I think that Betsy is absolutely right. And I think, you know, for me personally, I've got the additional identity of being an underrepresented minority. So you learn uh, through your life how to balance and how to deal with um, multiple issues and uh, challenges from any number of perspectives and how you think about not only balancing those internally but also think about how you are then modeling how you are addressing those challenges for young people because you are in an education role to me is critically important and being able to not only do it but then model it for young people so whether it's the the responding in a way that says no we will continue or in some other situations actually showing what um, what a very difficult negotiation might look like and making that transparent as opposed to only internal, I think is also important. Just before you came to Wellesley, you gave an interview in which you said, it's uh, great that w uh, women's leadership is finally being recognized, but there are gaps. Now, several months later, your most famous alum uh, hit that ceiling um, at Wellesley uh, in, in the presidential election. So where are the gaps? The obvious one is the presidency, but where else do you see the gaps? Oh, I think Kathy had, had mentioned uh, a few, and I think it, all you need to do is look at most of the highest um, offices in this country, whether it be in corporate America, 
whether it be in biotech, Silicon Valley, whether it be in our Congress, I mean, I could go on and on, you know, we have not near reached parity. Um, so I think that's pretty clear. And then the, the policies that actually pave the way to leadership. You know, we don't exist in a vacuum. You don't go from here to here in one day, but those policies um, are sorely lacking, whether they be family-friendly policies mm -hmm. um, or, quite frankly, whether they be policies and enforcement of policies that address things like sexual harassment and gender harassment in the workplace, which is still, I'm leading a, a panel for the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine on this topic, on the impact mm -hmm. on uh, careers of women in STEM. And the numbers are appalling in terms of this set of issues in our work environment, and particularly um, as we are looking at the STEM fields. So there are any number of areas, and that's not even addressing equal pay, um, but there are any number of areas where we look at the gap, but then the question is how do we actually close it? And it's not only policy, but it's the implementation of the policy and really understanding the culture change that that will require. And that's long and hard work. I'd like to hear uh, more about how you impart a lot of this wisdom to the students on your campus, especially the women. And one of the first questions I have is, I know when I was coming up, when I was in college, which was in the early 1970s, at that moment in the women's movement, um, the mantra was, you can have it all. You can have it all. That, of course, has undergone some revision. <laughs> is, what is it now that young women are being told about what their potential is and can be? Well, nobody can have it all, not even men, right? <laughs> I mean, there are, we're all limited by time, and so I sometimes say to young women that I'm mentoring or speaking in front of, uh, you can have enough. You can certainly have a successful career and be a mother, as um, we have all shown and many thousands of women across the country have shown, even in top leadership positions. I know at, at Smith, we're, we're starting a leadership program as part of the co-curriculum. We're mm -hmm. piloting things now because um, right off the bat, we want to say to them, uh, you can, not just that you can be successful, but that you can be a leader and leadership skills can be taught, um, giving them opportunities to practice while they're at Smith, which we all do, right? Whether you're uh, you know, the, the head of the student newspaper or the captain of the soccer team, something like that. But I think we need to um, talk about it, but also back to making the invisible visible, letting them know that this is a gendered world. So they, in order to be successful, I think, um, women need to work together, and we, we can talk about that if you want to, probably find male uh, mentors and supporters because it's still a man's world and I know that's been important to me. I bet it's been important to all of us because how else do you get ahead without um, working, you know, constructively with men. But I think we just have to keep talking about it. So, you know, I think it's, it's, not, um, it's not a unilateral, um, we are going to create leaders. This is really about how do we think about all of the resources we have and the students who are coming to us? Mm -hmm. And what does that transformation over four years look like? So there are a few things. I want to get back to the health piece because I do think it's important. Um, we are seeing increasing rates of mental health hospitalizations across the country. Um, and this is, uh, this is literally a very serious problem. We are seeing more and more students finishing high school, coming to college, who already have experience with depression or anxiety. Um, we also are seeing students who come to us with different physical ailments. And that is because of chronic disease. And that is the beauty of modern medicine. But that also means that when our students come to us and then they go through this transformation in the four years, that we have to pay attention not only to the most directed pieces of education that are more traditional, mm -hmm. but we have a very big responsibility to make sure our students are supported, that our students are graduating with the best health, both physical and emotional, that they can. And what does that mean for the transformation on our campus? To me, it's no longer a side business or a side activity. This is integral 
um, to what we are as a college, both in the out of the classroom environment, but quite frankly, on the in the classroom environment. What that looks like, we will begin to go on that journey because it's one again, again one where they're, they're really, the evidence is not clear. People are doing, presidents are doing, schools are doing a lot of different things. We have not come together. And there's real work um, to be done. And in this era, you talked about the election, when our students are experiencing certain levels of stress that I think are, are, um, are, are quite, to me, distressing. You know, we have hostile policies on immigration. Um, even if you don't have a large number of dreamers in your school, which we don't, we have a large population of students whose parents are undocumented. The stress they have lived with, and then the stress, the increased stress, mm -hmm. how do they perform? What does that mean? What do we do as a school? Our Muslim students, we have a diverse student population. What does truly being inclusive mean? To me, that doesn't have the label of leadership, but it is essential that we embrace all of the above in order for us to produce the leaders of tomorrow. Well, it empowers the students yeah. in ways to feed every piece of yeah. who they are and what they need. Do you ever feel, though, that colleges are being asked to do too much today? No, I don't, actually. I mean, I don't think we can be, you know, we aren't. No, I think that we have to change. And I think this is part of the transformation we have to go through. I've been asked that, and I've been in groups where that has been, you know, is it too much? Are we therapeutic environments? There's, there are a lot of words around it. I think we should get rid of the words and begin to say, what, who are our students that we are so proud and honored and privileged to have? What do we do best? And then where are those gaps where we need to change given today's world? in order to truly educate and produce students at the end of that journey who are ready to build that next phase of their life. And I think that that's a transformation we have to, we have to undertake. Betsy? Yeah, well, first of all, I completely agree with what both of you women said, and you rock, the two of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad to be in your peer group. Uh, I wanted to just make one other point I think wasn't made um, of what liberal arts is. And as um, I think Paula just said, you know, there are a lot of words thrown around, and that's thrown around a lot. Uh, but if we really go back to the history, the really deep ancient Greece history of liberal arts, a huge part of this was having dedicated time when you would figure out who you were. Mm -hmm. Who am I as a person in the environment I live in? And I sometimes think that we have forgotten that because we have so many other things we need yeah. to teach students and so many other issues they bring us. But the simple back to, I'm 18, I don't have any parents, who am I gonna be in the world? Who am I? Mm -hmm. That's huge. And if we all think about our time when we figured out, ooh, I'm inspired, I think that's a really exciting part of liberal arts education. And that's not too much. That's what we are there for. Yeah. And I think if that can be a productive three or four years, uh, understanding who one is and how you fit in the environment, that produces empowered people. That produces people who can lead or follow, whichever they want, subsequently. Someone's got to follow. We don't need just leaders. Uh, and I think it is, um, it's really the way to go, to put some focus on that, conscious, make it visible yeah. that that's actually what we're doing. What do you think the students of today's expectations are in terms of how far they can go with this education you're giving them? Well, I think their expectations are very high and um, ought to be. I mean, I have uh, students in my office all the time um, thinking about how to make Smith a stronger place, and they have ideas, and it often involves adding more staff, you know, and it's, uh, I think that's what really limits us, because at the same time, we want to support their, all of their needs, not just their needs in the classroom, but um, in their dormitories and on the sports fields and, and so on. There are some limits, given that we want to keep the costs of college uh, reasonable. But um, they, I am experiencing them as educated consumers who, um, who, who have um, thoughts about what Smith should be. And when, when, um, when we, you know, it's interesting, when, when we don't meet their expectations, I find sometimes they're a little bit sad because um, 
most students love their college very, very much. And so when we don't get it right, I think they, they are predominantly sad, but they're, they're partners in this work of what Smith is going to be going forward. Every single class that comes in really changes the institution, and I think mostly for the better. Paula, after the presidential election, you wrote a letter to the campus in which you said, um, our conviction stands that women's leadership is the surest way to change the world for the better. Um, were, the, were the young women on your campus shaken by that in terms of what it meant for what they could achieve or might achieve? Well, I think they weren't necessarily thinking about it in the personal. I think they were thinking about it more in terms of what it meant for the country, um, for their place in the country, and for those whom they love and care about. So I think it was much more about the potential changes that they were anticipating and what that meant. And you can, I mean, we've, we've seen some of that borne out. So I think there was a tremendous disappointment and anxiety um, around that. And I think our role then is to use the election as the opportunity to say, look at where we've achieved, and then to say, how are we going to use this to propel us forward and think about those challenges and meet them as a community? I have totally lost track of time. <laughs> 15. I apologize. 15 minutes. So I have more questions, but I know that you all do too. So I now, at this point, would like to open it up to the audience. I apologize. Um, there are two folks with microphones. The lady in the black, a uh, mic is coming right up to you. Ch Alice Chen from San Francisco. Yeah. Um, a little have, louder, Alice. Alice Chen from San Francisco. I have a, I have a specific question that's linked to a larger question. And um, so over the last two days, I feel like more than half the panels I've been to have actually referenced Professor Bradley's work oh around the mal maldistribution of um, healthcare resource be between healthcare and social services and international comparisons. And really, I guess my, my specific question, which I think has a larger linkage, is um, as you transition to this new role, what's your thinking about how to move that work forward? And given that each of the three of you has deep um, you know, academic creds or, you know, like uh, as, as experts and um, content uh, expertise, like I hear that you're called to something larger because of the opportunities to contribute. How do you um, balance that with leaving behind your expertise? Is there a sense of, of, of loss of identity? How do you continue the work you've been committed to for decades in the past? Right, yeah. I've given this a little bit of thought. Uh, because this obviously was a bit of a struggle. Uh, so a few things about that. It dawned on me, even though looking back, people can point out particular parts of my work and say, wow, you did that work and that's so important. Actually, I've just done tons of different kinds of studies and I've always done diverse things and I don't really expect it to change. I definitely need to focus on how do you be a president of a college. But the excitement to be able to work with faculty who are really excited about this work or that work, you know, I'm still very much in the milieu. I also think that um, already, and we just talked about this at the beginning of the panel, I'm dying for data. <laughs> and when I see that data, ideas are going to come. And I think I'll write about them. And that's sort of how I've always done my research. Um, it hasn't been a straight path. I'm going to write that book and it's going to... It just sort of happened because I'm always curious and I'm always thinking about things and I'm always looking for evidence. So I have this, not that I can have it all, but I, ha I think I can have enough yeah. uh, of writing and still doing some research. And I think it's important for college presidents to at least be public intellectuals, that they are still, mm -hmm. in fact, using the intellectual training they have, not simply managing. Is there That's a question? Can I, just, can I just answer Sure. That? Because I think for, for me, it's no surprise, there's a direct correlation. I mean, my area, I was, again, received, you know, how could you leave what you had at Harvard um, and, uh, and move? It was very interesting. When I had been tapped to look at a few other places, I'd kind of begun to really think about this. It wasn't necessarily in my plan. But I really did fall in love with the notion of, um, really that next phase being um, really teaching or being at an, a, a, an institution where we were focused on the next generation 
in a very important way. With that said, it became very clear to me as I explored where I was in that spectrum, it was very clear to me that I wanted to be at a women's college. If I were to ever make this move, it would have to be for a women's college. I tucked that away, left it, and basically a year and a half later, Wellesley hmm. um, came, came the opportunity. And I think that some of my work that's focused on sex and gender, focused on the health and well-being of women, um, is absolutely uh, applicable in some of the ways that I discussed. And thinking about that from a scientific standpoint, thinking about that from a public health approach, um, I think that there will be that, be that opportunity to work with Wellesley um, to really do some really interesting work that will be published. Um, so that I hope would be, I shouldn't say will be, that I hope would be. So I think that there's a very close connection um, and one that I feel it's been a, a, a continuum, a difference, but a continuum. Is there a question on this side? Yes, right in the back. Hi, Eli Hesterman from Furman University, where we have a woman social scientist president. Um, and I, this was partially addressed, I think, in the, um, in the last comments, but I'm just curious, each of you came from a large comprehensive research university to a liberal arts college, and I'm curious what was attractive about that, that move in particular. Kathy? Sure. Um, when I started exploring um, other opportunities, I, I was quite deliberately um, exploring liberal arts colleges because you're very close to the work there. If you're a president of a large research one university, there are layers and layers that are separating you from students and from faculty, actually. And I know this, I knew this to be true recently. I mentioned I was at Northwestern. I asked Morty Shapiro, the president there, to compare his experience at Northwestern versus Williams. And he confirmed that for me. He, he said it, it was actually a much easier job at Northwestern <laughs> than it had been at Williams. So maybe we chose something hard, but I have a feeling we've done that our whole careers. I, I wanted to be close to the work. And boy, are you close to the work. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're walking, through campus, people stop you and um, give you their thoughts and share their experiences, um, sometimes in very gratifying ways, like a, a student kind of galloping over to you to, to let you know she did something that she's especially proud of. And I have to say, um, I did enter one search in, at a co-ed liberal arts college, and I made the top three, and I withdrew, um, making the search firm crazy. But it just didn't feel right to me. And like Paula, once I started exploring Smith and thinking about everything in my career sort of leading up to women's education, my work on, on child care and maternal employment, for example, it just felt like the right fit. Hmm. Betsy? Uh, well, first of all, Vassar has men. I just yes. want everybody to know that. <laughs> You're still a seven sister, though. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we, we have all kinds of genders, so come on over. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think that I agree with Kathy. I really like to be close to the work. I love students. I've been the head of college at Brantford College, which is in Yale College, and have just found the undergraduate experience to be the most meaningful. Um, I do think I'll miss the researchers who are constantly, but then I got to know all the faculty at Vassar, and I was just overjoyed with how much research they're doing. So at first, I had come with the bias that, oh, they won't, they'll, they won't do that much research, but I've been so pleasantly surprised by that. So um, I think being close to the work and it being kind of ma seemingly manageable were attractions for me. Can I just add one thing to that? Because I also think the power of being in a liberal arts environment in which, again, the mission is so strongly held mm -hmm. by the faculty, by the, the staff, I mean, and of course, you're there to serve and to really educate this next generation of students. Um, and the true dedication to teaching, to scholarship, and to service in ways that I think serve the college and the greater good are so palpable at every moment that um, to me it's just a very compelling environment. Both of my children who are 25, twin boys, went to private liberal arts schools. And in their time, it seemed that there was still something else that was added to this menu. And that is making sure they're employable, mm -hmm. getting them ready in a more deliberate way yeah. for jobs. Yeah. 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 
we is that had, an, it's, uh, we have a new you know I think that this is this is a challenge for colleges and universities and we've been fortunate enough to start um, a new career education program that um, the idea is how do we prepare our students to build a life mm. and um, and also that this will be available for our alumni as well oh with the idea that it isn't just about your first job but most of our students um, are going to have multiple jobs and potentially multiple different yeah. routes. And I yeah. always use myself as, we can all, as Exhibit A. Yeah. Um, but it's our responsibility to do this, um, to really prepare them. And you know, there was a little bit of noise amongst the faculty around, are we, are we um, being too directive? Um, and I view it as it's important that they begin, that they be able to launch their lives. And in a way, if we do this well, then we open our students up to being able to fully take advantage of a liberal arts education mm -hmm. in a way that they explore deeply fields that they would not necessarily mm -hmm. explore mm -hmm. because they know that we are with them in a very different way. So I think it's really important. Good. Yes, sir. Uh, Michael Hughes from Miami. I'm a psychiatrist. I went to Notre Dame as an undergraduate when it was an all-male school, except for an occasional nun. And <laughs> what I, in looking back on it, I think my grades were a little better because it was an all-male school, but I was socially delayed, I have to admit. Where an all-male school may have helped me was uh, in grade school, where the teachers were all female and the smartest people in the class were all girls. So maybe an all-male school might have helped then. Um, my question would be for the three of you, what are the advantages and disadvantages of a single-sex school for women and for men? Well, I'll just say that um, this is back to uh, a point that Betsy made about a person-environment fit that I think there are advantages for some women to study at a women's college and maybe not for all women, but for some women, um, it's what they want. And there are a variety of ways um, that I think it supports a woman's development. I mean, for example, in, in a science classroom, the professor is only focused on women's students, right? There can be none of this implicit bias. And uh, I've had students tell me that uh, when they get into, especially I had a student in engineering last fall, was trying to decide between two places and visited them both and was convinced by the way that she was treated by the faculty that she'd have a better experience at Smith. But maybe another student would have visited both places and made a different decision. So I think um, I, it's, you know, I wouldn't say that Smith and Wellesley are for everyone, but I will tell you this, our applications have increased 21% in the last three mm -hmm. years. And I, I think, wow. yeah, I, I think there are more women, uh, when, the, when schools went co-ed, I think the women's colleges kind of lost their way. Like, what are we about? And now we're very proudly proclaiming what we do and why we do it, so. Have you had the same experience? And uh, is there a downside? He did ask if there was. I don't think it's a down, there's a downside for the students who, who choose to come. And I do think that there is um, increasing interest. I mean, our applications as well were up 17% this year. Hmm. Um, and. I, I think that for a certain population of students, you know, we both have a certain mix as well. Let's, mm -hmm. you know, be clear. We have the mix of being an all women's college, but we are also outstanding, lib we are delivering an outstanding top rate liberal arts education. So I think between the two, right. when we have, there are students who come to Wellesley who come because it's a women's college. Then there are students who come because it's a top liberal arts college and they weren't really that interested in the fact that it was a women's it was college a secondary but issue. to be honest by time they leave we, and we've looked at this by time they leave the passion for their experience and for being at a women's college has transformed the sense mm -hmm. of community must be yep. stronger yes. yep well you're going to a co-ed college i don't have enough experience for all this right question. one <laughs> last question on this side anyone okay. up in the front um, good afternoon, my name is Ronnie Morales, and I'm actually a local. I work for Community Health Center as a patient advocate. And so it has been an extreme pleasure to listen to all four of you speak this evening. Um, so for me personally, um, 
patriarchy and misogyny in my culture um, is, we're getting better, I have to say, but it, it still exists very strongly, especially um, not as much on this side of the border as, you know, and from our country of origin. When I think about women in leadership positions, as someone who is a leader in her organization and mentoring other women to be leaders, um, I have to struggle with two things constantly. One is um, as I ascend, as we ascend into leadership, um, clearly, you know, culturally, as you talked about, you know, having, yes, I'm a woman, yes, I'm a leadership, but I also have this other identity, right? So being accused of selling out, one, my favorite, oh, sell out, mm. okay. And then the second one is always the, um, you know, the complexity of, of just being a woman, multiracial, having to navigate in a world and having, I always feel like I have to do twice as hard mm. to prove my worth. And, um, and, and, and I don't find, I, I find that I think that I can do really good with um, the challenges of like patriarchy and stuff like that, but I'm always surprised at women's behavior sometimes mm -hmm. of not being as supportive. How do you effectively confront that challenge? Great question. That is a wow. great question. I, I think you, um, I, I want to tell a story about the Obama administration, which is that um, uh, when they all got to Washington, the men's voices were dominant. And uh, the women decided that in meetings they were going to try to amplify one another's voices so that, let's say Paula said mm -hmm. something at the meeting, I, I want to second what Paula's saying. Yes. And uh, I think that what this example shows is how the women got together and really made a difference as a, as a block, so to speak. So uh, that's, your question is such a big one, but that's one of the things that I, I would say to you, and I, I guess the other thing I can't resist saying is maybe this is me as a psychologist, but there are so many times that people take you sort of away from your core and what you know in your gut is true. And sometimes it just takes you a while to go back there. So just keep listening to your gut. And the Thanks. only other thing, <laughs> it's true, the only other thing that, that I would add is this notion of multiple identities, the intersectionality of who we are is so much a part today of our campuses. But I think you're right. We can't take for granted mutual support. And I'll give you an example where it's very well known that um, as we look at different populations, racial, ethnic minorities, et cetera, on campuses, that there are ways in which our own students exclude other students. Mm -hmm. um, and that's women also. I mean, uh, this is happening across campuses. So I think it's our responsibility as we think about what is support, what is it that we want to model. We've really got to tackle this. We've got to tackle the, the biases that exist within our own communities that really inhibit the very students that we are looking to advance from maybe achieving what they can absolutely achieve. So we have, you know, I like to think about it as we have, we are very proud of the diversity that we have brought to our campuses. We have not yet been transformed by that diversity. And that's the next piece of work that we really have to do. What is that transformation of the institution that needs to happen to truly embrace the, that, that, that diversity fully. Thank you, thank you all very much. Going back to Frances Willard, the first female college president in the United States <laughs> who fought for the women's vote and learned how to ride a bike, I think she would be really pleased <laughs> where all of us are right now. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.